Thank you, chairs. Uh, thank you for the organizing committee for inviting me to also present some of the work here at the University of Chicago. Um, I actually chose the title to be able to be uh, quite controversial in some sense, but also to try to utilize some mathematics to be able to predict for cancers, and especially in the context of malignant mesothelioma. So fractal was defined by Benoit Mandelbrot approximately 50 years ago or so, and that's a mathematical set or concrete object that is irregular or fragmented at all scales. That is, it's a self-iterative function, and what's shown there is a cock model of human airways that can be predicted in the terms of a complex plane, but that's very similar to a cast of human airways. And a lot of things are fractal in nature, you know, we deal with uh, Euclidean geometry a lot in terms of building buildings and so forth, but nature really uses non-Euclidean geometry. So as an example of non-Euclidean geometry, the top panel is the Sierpinski carpet, and you can see that at every magnification there is self-similarity. But then nature itself has developed, for example, a fern, a tree, and when you look at various scales of the fern, that is a very similar types of an object. And then Benoit initially, Mandelbrot himself, initially described in a science paper uh, about 50 years ago or so, looking at the coastline of Great Britain, that you can actually predict the dimensionality using fractal analysis. And what's interesting to know is that dimensionality is no longer in integer numbers, that is, it's not 1, 2, and 3, but it can be non-integer numbers such as 1.2 or 1.4, and I'll show examples of that itself. So how can we use fractals in biology and mesothelioma? Certainly many biological systems, so that is nature itself, has developed branching systems, such as neurons, cardiovascular system, lung airways that I gave the example for, heartbeat and respiration uh, rates that are also very iterative types of functions, cell cytoskeletal cell shape, which I'll show in a few minutes, as well as chromatin packaging in the nucleus, and that is you can have fractal globules within the nucleus themselves. There are pathological changes that can manifest as changes in fractal dimension, and these systems are being utilized in our group to study, such as nuclear heterogeneity, that is change in chromatin structure, mitochondrial dynamics, for which I'll give some examples for in the context of mesothelioma, histological classification, as well as radiological parameters and clinical imaging that could be important in terms of prognostic and predictive signatures themselves. So here are some examples of malignant pleural mesothelioma subtypes, for example, hyperplasia, biphasic, sarcomatoid, as well as epithelioid type. And what one can look at it are their fractal dimensions at various magnification under the microscope. So this gives one example of 15x, 20x, 30x, and 40x for epithelioid versus hyperplasia. Remember this, uh, cart uh, remember these H&E pictures because we'll come back to that for their analysis themselves. But I want to step back a little bit and come back to the fractal analysis in terms of mathematical equation. Fractal analysis actually uh, sits under the umbrella of chaos theory. And chaos is not what we think of as a lack of order. In mathematical terms, it re really repre um, replenishes the uh, behavior as well as appears to be random, but it's not. And chaos differs from randomness in that chaotic systems are purely deterministic. So this is truly deterministic chaos, and that is entirely determined by a set of rules. So nature, for example, has built a tree or coastline of Great Britain, as an example. And there are no random elements involved. And the chaotic systems are really dependent on the previous conditions. So x sub n is dependent on x sub n minus 1. And one can think of that in the context of, for example, the weather pattern, which depends on the previous weather patterns in terms of predictability as we go into the future for the weather patterns. Simulations of chaotic system indicate a system initiated in only slightly different states, and they can diverge a lot. And that was what's called the Lorentz effect that was initially described for weather patterns themselves. So we've started to play chaos games, and I'm glad Consti uh, presented in the context of various DNA abnormalities that can occur. But we can look at the deterministic chaos for DNA abnormalities that can occur. So let's play a chaos game. Uh, for example, let's draw a square put a point in the middle, and then label the corners A, T, G, and C, and then let's have a sequence of A, A, T, G, A, 
And so from the initial point, you can actually pick the point anywhere in the square. Then you go halfway up to that point. So if you have A, you go halfway up to A. Then you go uh, then halfway up to A again, and then to T, and then to G, and then to A as, a, as an example. So we've done that as an example for chromosome 7. Chromosome 7 has interesting structures. For example, the MET receptor tyrosine kinase is located there. Hepatocyte growth factor is on chromosome 7. EGF receptor is on chromosome 7. And I, can, I think you can appreciate as we go down about 150 million base pairs or so, there's a self-iterative or self-image that one can see as you go from left to right as an example. These look like castles in the sky, so to speak, but this is truly the iterative function that really DNA f acts like a fractal itself. But then what happens when you have mutation? So instead of having a square chaos game or a square uh, deterministic game, you can actually do what's called a random walk. And this is really sequencing in the, time, in the context of a DNA walk, and the starting point is zero, 0, So one could think of it like a complex plane where you can have an imaginary line versus a real line, but in this case you have A, T, G, C, and you move up A, T, G, and C as an example, and then each sequence gives a unique trajectory. So the example was beautiful that you gave, Consti, and here's, for example, NF2 mRNA variants that occur in mesothelioma, as an example, or in other tumors that have been identified. And if you can graph this function, you can actually appreciate in color that the variants of NF2 are quite different in terms of their fractal analysis. And so the fractal dimensionality of DNA as well as the chromatin structure is quite interesting and quite different. So how can we measure fractals? This is not meant to be a mathematical lecture, but much more so a biological lecture. I thought I needed to get into the fractal dimensionality to be able to say you can do box counting. What fractal dimensionality shows is the complexity of the structure itself, but then there's an opposite of fractality, and that's called lacunarity. And lacunarity describes the texture of a fractal, and that is the size and distribution of the holes. And for anyone interested, the mathematical equations are listed there. But here's one example of another curve which are known as monster curves. In the traditional Euclidean geometry, as an example, you can never quantitate the area here, and you could never quantitate the surface area, or you can never quantitate the perimeter. However, you can quantitate the fractal dimensionality. So what one can do is to cover by boxes, and we can cover this fractal with one box of size one, or five boxes of size one-third, or nine, uh, 25 boxes of size one-ninth, and plot that on a log scale. So on the ordinate, for example, is the number of boxes, and on the abscissa is the box size. And that's a one-to-one -one function, and then that gives you the dimensionality. And for example, the dimension of this structure itself is 1.4654. So well, what about mesothelioma? Let's come back to reality. Can you do the same thing? Can one measure fractal dimensionality? And certain things fell into place. Even though normal versus cancer cells are two, two different things, however, they are still reflecting nature and what ap appears in nature itself. So here, for example, is fractal dimensionality on the ordinate, and on the abscissa are the various tumors, as well as hyperplasia and benign. And these are quite significantly different. That is, the fractal dimensionality of mesothelioma cells are much higher as compared to normal cells. As well, if you look at the lacunarity, which you remember I said was the texture of the tumor, and one can appreciate that indeed the lacunarity is much lower for the various tumor types, sarcomatoid, epithelioid, and so forth, as compared to normal cells. And so what Consti presented, what you'll be hearing throughout this um, lecture series over the next few days, is that there are all these genetic abnormalities that can occur. There are all these proteomic abnormalities that can occur in mesothelioma or in cancer in particular, but they all have to be driven by something. You can certainly talk about passenger versus driver, but ultimately it's the cellular function that's important. Can you have multiple abnormalities that can lead to the abnormalities of cellular function? Can you have a single abnormality that can lead to a cellular function? And here, for example, we've been trying to study mitochondrial dynamics, and mitochondrial dynamics not only reflects the production of oxygen, but it also reflects how the cell behaves. And so this is a new concept where mitochondria don't exist as single cell organelle, they actually work as networks. And as you can appreciate on the top, le top left hand panel for fusion of mitochondria, 
Let me see if I can actually show you that. And you see here uh, on A and B, if you can pay attention, in fusion of the mitochondria, there's a different functionality as compared to fission of the mitochondria. Fission of the mitochondria can occur in the active state when the cell is dividing, or it can also occur in the starvation state when the cell is trying to preserve itself. And one has to be also looking at, for example, the spatial dynamics themselves, and the spatial dynamics link the mitochondria with the actin cytoskeleton. So all of these genetic abnormalities you see have to deal with the cellular organelle, such as the mitochondria, to be able to lead to plethora of changes that exist in cancer. So we started to look at the mitochondrial morphology in mesothelioma. MET5A represents the control mesothelial cells. You can see this immunofluorescence for actin, which is red, I'm sorry, actin, which is green, and the mitochondria, which is red. And you can see the nice localization of mitochondria that occurs in normal cells, but there's paranuclear organization of the mitochondria that exerts in the abnormal cells, but it also is linked to the actin cytoskeleton and how the changes of the actin cytoskeletons occur. And one can then measure the mitochondrial morphology or the dynamics in mesothelioma with fractal dimension. And what one can appreciate is there seems to be a difference for fractal dimension. And this depends on the state of the cell itself. But one also knows that there's changes in lacunarity that can occur with certain cells and not in other cells. And to try to explore this further, what one can do is to link the fractality with the lacunarity. And this is much more like a Star Wars plot. Um, where you can actually look at the lacunarity on the ordinate as well as the fractal dimension on the abscissa, one can see that there's a difference in MET5A, which is the control cell in blue, versus the other cells which are in different colors themselves. And I think it's really the fractality as well as the lacunarity, these mathematical modeling that will reflect the mitochondrial changes and the mitochondrial morphology. And this may become an important biomarker for us to study as we go forward. But there are a lot of biomarkers that one can think about. One can think about the genomics you just heard about earlier, proteomics that all of us are trying to discover, metabolomics that's important in the context of mitochondrial functionality, as well as signaling itself. And so a lot of signaling pathways have been defined by many of you in this room and by others internationally. But at the same time, we've been working on it for over a decade. For example, the MET receptor tyrosine kinase can signal through various pathways. And what one can see is that there's a plethora of systems biology that have interactions as well as changes that can occur in mesothelioma. So here, for example, are some mitochondrial proteins that can be abnormal in mesothelioma cell lines. MFN2 is important because it causes fusion of the mitochondria. DRP1 is important because it can cause fission of the mitochondria. Other proteins are related to mitochondrial function, as well as cytoskeletal proteins, such as FAC and Pexoin, which are quite important in the context of determining how important are cells and movement of cells themselves. So at least from the summary of all that data for mitochondrial dynamics and mesothelioma, I can say that the mitochondria in the control cell is elongated and network, and ATP is produced via oxidative phosphorylation, and it, you also have low trap one which is the chaperone for DRP1. And the balance of the fission and fusion is important, that is DRP1 as well as MFN2. In mesothelioma, this is quite opposite, and you have increased glycolysis, and you do have increased TRAP1 expression itself. So what about these genetic alterations? Again, you saw earlier in terms of the Sanger sequencing, we've also been doing next-gen sequencing at the University of Chicago. This is a compilation of 55 uh, people, or 55 patient sample set, and you can see a lot of abnormalities that can occur. But ultimately, as biologists, we have to be able to say not only can there be changes in the molecular architecture, but there have to be changes within the cellular organization as well as cellular uh, functionality itself. And it's also broken down within our group in terms of mesothelioma for pleural versus peritoneal. And there are some similarities and there are some uh, differences as well, and this needs to be teased out much more. So can this be teased out, again, in the context of functionality of, uh, of the cell? And we're started to look at how fusion and fission is interacting. And what I can say at this moment in time is that at least for mesothelioma, there's higher fission rate as compared to fusion rate. And this is actually the ratio. 
And then going further to be able to look at the oxidative metabolism, one can see in the OCR from the seahorse technology is that you do have abnormality for mesothelial cells as compared to normal cells, but I'll actually come back to it's really the ratio that's important. That is the ECAR, which is the extracellular acidification rate, and one can see that the ECAR is quite abnormal in mesothelioma cells. But ultimately, it's the OCR to ECAR ratio, that is the oxidative phosphorylation to the glycolytic function of the mitochondria that's important, and especially that gets us back to the Warburg effect that's quite important to study as we go forward. But this is also in the context of looking at genetic alterations as well as cellular functionality themselves. So again, another Star Wars plot, and what one can see is that the MET5A is different as compared to the other cells. Again, on the uh, ordinate is the oxidative rate, and on the abscissa is the glycolytic rate, and that is quite different in normal cells as compared to abnormal cells themselves. So I'm going to summarize it here, and to be able to say that the fractal base analysis can be used to detect pathological changes in mesothelioma. And histological and immunofluorescent images are quite helpful to be able to define this FD. And in future, it can be applied to radiographic images, to solid tumors, and to other tumors themselves. And mesothelioma cells show altered mitochondrial morphologies. And mesothelioma cells have increased level of glycolysis with increased ECAR and increased expression of MCT4, which is the lactate exporter. And there's an imbalance in the expression of the mitochondrial fission diffusion proteins, DRP1 and MFN2. And that will become a very important therapeutic target as we inhibit fission in various cancer cells. And increased expression of TRAP1, a mitochondrial chaperone, is really the molecular switch that we believe that may cause the cells to go from glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation and vice versa. And mitochondrial dynamics-related proteins and signaling represents a novel therapeutic target in mesothelioma. I feel like I'm a reporter for our whole program, and I want to thank our whole mesothelioma program at the University of Chicago, and thank you again for inviting me to present.